My name is Mike Miller. I'm, I'm with Python for like about 15 years now. And I'm with Python Academy, actually I'm the founder of Python Academy and we teach Python all kinds of Python from the very beginning to advanced courses, scientist courses, and web development. It's about like we are about six trainers now in total. And we really focus on Python and we can really offer very advanced and very specialized Python courses. That's what we do. And I also teach a lot of tutorials. So I go to PyCon US in April and we'll teach tutorial 14 and 15 there. So I um, do a lot of those things. And this is just a small part of what you can do with Python, some examples that fits in this high performance uh, track here. And this talk very nicely uh, fits together with what just Ian, Ian just gave, a, gave an overview of this uh, uh, high performance landscape in Python about profiling and some tools. And I would like to focus on one tool and especially on the parallel aspect. So everybody knows things getting parallel, things are parallel already. And there will be way more parallelism in the, in the future. And this GPU seems like the GPU kind of merged with the normal CPU more or less in one way or the other. They're giving you uh, even more cores. So probably soon we will talk about hundreds and thousands of cores and you want to go parallel. And there are different approaches, people are working with it. It's not simple. There are still things, things involved there, but uh, there are some, some tools there and they will get, get, get better. We saw there's a lot of development, a lot of new things, and I'm going to show you one thing. So the first thing I want to introduce you to Sison. So Sison, we saw already, so I just want to go in a bit more detail. It's a mixture between Python and C. It's a very nice mixture. So if you have normal Python, you just compile it to Sison, you have to not single, change a single line, and you get the extension module. It won't get much faster, but you can do it. So Stefan Wendel, he's a, one of the core developers. Mark Florison is also here. He also worked on Sison. He's somewhere here, at least at the conference. I talked to him here last night and today and yesterday. Uh, and he compiled the whole standard library in Python. And I think 600 modules compiled, only two didn't compile. So you can compile everything to, share, to shared libraries. So you, then you have some people say, oh, we, we, we don't want to distribute Python bytecode. We want to just give shared libraries. Then you can do this. And you might get a bit faster. And I talk to other people just have normal projects. And they get about 40% faster just by compiling everything with size and don't change a single thing. That's one way of doing it. But you, the nice thing is you can gradually go from Python to C and, and get and see where the, where the time goes. So we, we look at this annotation. And also, uh, Sison not only supports C, it also supports C++, which is important. So you can wrap C++. It's a bit of work because you have to put some manual work in there. But you can give your interface a nice Pythonic flavor if you want to. So like C exceptions will be turned into, C++ exceptions will be turned into Python exceptions. And then if you have a bunch of getters and setters and stuff, you can change them to properties and things like this. So you can make nice interfaces. And this is something you might be able to automate some way or the other. But very often for every library, it's a bit different. So either you do it by hand or you write your own tools. That it's always an option. Sometimes writing your own tools is better than trying to shoehorn a tool that exists in some, some way. So there's always, always a, some advantages, disadvantages. And the whole thing you compile to a shared library, uh, SO or PYD, which is a Python DLL on Windows, and it works pretty pretty well. Makes things much easier. If you ever written the extension by hand, which I think very few people still do, so I remember back 10 years or even longer than you wrote these things by hand, which is a lot of work. So there's a lot of users of Sison, so even though you don't use Sison yourself, you do, because uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, tools use SciPy uses Science and Pandas makes a lot of use Science and Pi tables, Zero and Q, Sage, and there are quite a few others. They all use Science in the background to wrap C. So obviously it works there, and they get something out of it. So your extension will be as fast as you, as you write things yourself, but it's much much less work, much more convenient to work with. So how does it work? The Science and workflow. You actually you create a PYX file, we see there are other possibilities, but that's usually how you do it. You create a PYX file, and a PYX file can be just a pure Python file in the beginning. We will do this. And then you can add some additional information that gives the size and compiler information what you, what, you, what you want, what you mean. So type annotations mainly. That is something you can do. And then you, ex you compile the thing with a setup file. We look at it for an example, and you get this extension module. 
and you can use extensions. So you can ship extensions. So that means that you work with Sison, your user doesn't need Sison. You compile it and you just ship your extension and they don't need a bother with Sison, they don't need a compiler. So in Windows, very often if you have normal users, they don't have a C compiler installed and nobody wants to bother to compile anything. So you can ship extensions uh, and this works. That's one way of doing it. Let's look at an example. So I had just I tried to boil down the code to a very simple example, otherwise, we get quite more involved in the end, but to understand the principle. So we have a pure Python function, which is just a add function. So we have A and B here, A and B, and you just add it and you get the result. And then you can do something called the cdef, and the cdef is a function that is a real C function. So there's a lot of additional, quite a few additional keyboards there, and one of them is cdef in, in uh, Sison. So this function would run a normal Python, no problem. This would be just a normal Python function. And this would, would not run. You cannot use it from Python. It's only available from C. You have to write a wrapper around it. So that's what I'm doing here. And you see, the first thing I just said, the whole thing is a, is a returns a double here. Of course, I say I want to have a double. This is new. And then I say A and B are doubles. This, and this means really C doubles, whatever. Uh, C understands there, will be translated, and then you can, can do, to use it, you have to write a Python function here that actually is calling this function to make it work, to make it call, uh, callable from Python to do this. That's all you need, so you need to specify the types, and that's most of the work is specifying the types here. And there are different ways, yeah, Ian showed some different ways writing the CDEF inside the file, we we'll see this later on, but there are different ways getting to the same result, and there's also some, sometimes some shortcuts that work for certain cases. So that's typically how you work. And then you write a setup file. That's usually how you do this. You want to automate things. You, because you don't want to remember the commands. So we write a setup file. And this is very easy. So you just have this, this details core is a setup. And then you have Sisonize. And for Sisonize, you just give this extension a name. So that's, that's the way it's, it's called. And then you just uh, um, list all the files you want to compile, there can be more than one, and then I give the, the option annotate true, and we'll see in a moment what it means. The annotation is a very nice thing to see what actually happens in the background. And then you call Python setup build extension in place. In place means it, it, co it copies the result of the, the, the shared library directly into my directory, otherwise you have to go hunt for it somewhere in the, the, the deep inside the build directory. So there's a bunch of options you can give here. There's the cheapest one, though. The easiest put this in a make file, type make, and there you go. You have this result, and then you can import it. See, now I import it, and here I import the pure Python function, and I import the type function. That's, a, that's my test thing, so I import this here. This is a, this is a shared library, actually. So the shared library is a name, cy underscore 101 dot so in my case, or if you're on Windows, pyd. It's located in the same directory, so I can import it. And then I use this thing, and I print it out, and you see this result. You see, if you use a Python function, I get an integer. If I use a C function, I get a float, because I said I want two doubles. And two doubles will be converted to Python float, so you get a Python float back, obviously. So that's, that's this. <laughs> this dot zero here is, is a sign that actually works. Yeah, so that's pretty simple. Uh, of course, there might be some more uh, complex use cases. You can also wrap existing, I don't show this here, you can wrap existing C functions very nicely. You can just Im import them, so to speak, and use them with, uh, with very little interface. And you can also access existing structures and a lot of other C uh, things. So I have a I have one of those, uh, I wrote one of those chemical libraries that's actually doing it. So this is very nice. It works with Python 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 3. It works with PyPy because it uses C types. And then uh, you can do something similar. You can access all this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this, this structures in, in C the way you want it. So we had, let's have a look. And this is the annotations. So that's what you get out of here. And Sison generates a lots and lots of C, but the C is not for human consumption, because Sison still, I think still, they still support old versions of, of, of Python 2.4, and then up to 3.3, .3. and then you, you generate a lot and lots of C, but usually most of the C is not designed for humans to read, because the compiler will throw most of it out anyway. And you can see here, this is pure, this is pure, pure uh, Python. If it's dark yellow, it's pure Python. Pure Python, and then you have this, uh, 
this white places and this white places is pretty much pure, pure C because you're on C code. And then this gives you some kind of a hint uh, what actually happens. So if it's everything is dark yellow, you probably have to do something if you want to get speed improvements. And if it's white, you're at the C level already and there won't be much more you can do with, with Sison unless you want to change your algorithms for sure, but in terms of the compilation step. So that's very nice, you get this information uh, out of, out of Sison and you can see what you can do. That's a very interactive thing. You just run it, look in your browser, and you see it's updated, and you see what changed. So that's pretty fast. And there's, there's some other nice things. Uh, now the newer versions of uh, Sison support a decorator syntax. So instead of actually putting this, putting this, uh, 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 this definition of double and everything, everything inside, Actually, that I, I don't even use a double here because the Python will, uh, Python will deduct it. That will be double. But I, just putting it in uh, inside the code, you can just put in the decorator. So you have this decorator. And then I think if you import Sison and you don't compile it, just you do it like this, then it will run as a normal, just a normal plain pure Python function. Nothing special to do. But if you have a Sison compiler and you compile it with a setup file, you will end up with an extension where you can use the extension. So you don't have to do any changes to your code. It just works. So that's a very nice thing. Of course, those decorators are very good tools for a lot of things. And them decorators are typically used for cross-cutting concerns. And this is a cross-cutting concern. It has nothing to do with your functionality of your code in, per se, but you want to compile it, which is something more a tooling thing. And that's what decorators are great for. And that's why you can use it here. And you can just specify a lot of things. You can do most of things with decorators. There are special, a few special things that are too deep inside when you just move pointers around what you can do, size if you want to do more sophisticated things, that you certainly do, then the stack writers might not work, but, but for a lot of those cases, you can, they work, and now you have a function that works with Python, so if somebody doesn't have size installed, it works with normal Python, but you can also uh, or you, uh, use it with size That's a nice thing. Yet another thing is, there's pi, a pix import, pix import, just uh, does away with this, with this explicit setup step. So you don't have to create a setup.py file and run it and compile it, but you just write, you just write this, this is my extension file with the pyx extension we saw before, just got rid of a few comments here, but it's the same thing. And then here you, you just say py, py pix import, pix import install, and now I can import this one, and this one actually when it imports it, it tries to compile it. It even tries to compile Python files. Compile everything before it's importing. If it works, uh, you can import the extension. So it will put the extension there, and you can import it and it works. So that's, that's something very nice for experimenting. You don't have to call the ex this uh, additional setup file. So that's uh, a pretty nice way of working with it. OK. Let's get a bit deeper. Let's look at the buffer interface. We talked about the buffer interface in the other. Uh, Ian talked about it already. So it's a, number, a, num, a numpy inspired standard to access C data structures from Python. And Sison supports this buffer interface, which is important. And just look at this. This is just a C struct that, that gives you some kind of hint. Is this a Python? It's a struct, but you see they have a Py object here. And then you have some information about it, the size, item size, looks very similar to what uh, numpy arrays are. You see? And this is this, this, this Py buffer object, and this helps to avoid copying data from C to Python back and forth. You just keep it there, and you just have a point or some reference and say, okay, that's my data, and I know what they mean, what the, what the data means, and then you don't have to copy things back and forth because copying data can be costly. That's pretty much just the, the, the the effect you get when you're using this buffer interface. So you don't need to bother with all the details if you don't want to. You just know that can help you make things faster because you can access it also, as well you can maybe help you profiling things. Okay, let's look at an example. I just chose one example, uh, what I do here, and try diff two different approaches. I didn't try all the all approaches. You can try many more and compare all the speeds, but just see what, what size thing is doing. So I have A and B. They are two D, uh, two D NumPy arrays with the same shape. And I do some calculation, just some A plus B times two plus A times B. And the size of this array is 2,000 by 2,000, so I have about four million elements. And just just work with those two arrays. And I try uh, a few different approaches to parallelize things, make things faster and see what, as an example, what uh, Sison actually can do with it. 
Okay, the first, my first naive thing is using multiprocessing, even if I know it might not be really useful, because you have this big array, and you want to do a rather simple calculation compared with the size. Uh, the first thing you have to chop this thing into sub-arrays, because you want to distribute it over, uh, over a few things. So the first thing I'm doing, I, I just get this, um, I just make sure both have the same shape here. That's something I want. And then I just half, this is a vertical and a horizontal. Uh, the middle of this, you see I do a floor division here, so I want to have really integers as a result. And I get pretty much the middle of this, of this thing. And then I use slice objects. Slice objects are the same thing they're using columns, but I, it's maybe nicer to work because you can reuse them. So I use slice objects, and this just means I have my four my big array and I chop it into four sub-arrays. That's pretty much what it means. So I have four sub-arrays, and you go over the sub-arrays. Uh, and what I'm doing here, I use a multiprocessing pool, apply asynchronous, and it's just okay. I throw in uh, uh, my, my data here, here for all of them, and just the function I want to call. We will we'll see in a minute when I call. And then uh, if the output, I, I create an output, which is, an, which is an empty array with the same shape, with the same shape and data type as A, and then I go through the result and use get. So this one is asynchronous, so I just send off four asynchronous calls to the test numpy, and then with get, I'm blocking and get the result back. This is multiprocessing, very nice. The problem is, the six times slower than the normal version, because this is a, this is a use case that's not very useful for, num for multiprocessing, because multiprocessing needs to serialize data, so every the sub -arrays has to be serialized, pickled, sent to a process, calculated, and the, and the result has to come back the same way. And this is kind of a, something you shouldn't do with this type of problem. For multiprocessing, you will need something. You don't have to distribute a big amount of data. We just send something like some sample, simple numbers or parameters, something to process, calculate something, and keep most of the calculations there and send a small result back. So the pickling overhead would be sm small compared to the calculation. And this is obviously multiprocessing is not, not good for this thing. Just as an example, if we just say we have multiprocessing to a parallel, you will get slower doing parallel. That might happen. And of course, you always need to measure if we get an effect out of it. OK, that's one, one, one thing you can do. And now you can also access this buffer interface. And that gets a bit more involved, so you have to write a, a bit more information in here. Um, first, there's a few more decorators, size and supplies. Like, you can turn bound checks off and wrap around. So I, I kind of turn off all the security nets I have. I can turn them on, make things slow, and I would get error message if something is wrong. So when you debug your code, you should better turn them on, see if something is wrong. So if you go outside of your bounds and stuff like this, which can happen, uh, you might not be already used to it in Python, because in Python typically, Python gives you, gives you exceptions if something like this happens, but here you just would go silent and you would create maybe strange results. So I turn them off to make it faster. And then here, you see now, I'm writing a function, and this function is supposed to work on a sub-array. So I don't get a, a full, the full array, I only get one quarter of the array at a time. And I do this by using the buffer interface, so I don't copy the whole array and put it as a copy and get it back, but rather get kind of pointers to, this, to the coordinates of this <laughs> subarray. And that's what I'm doing with this, with this structure here. So I have to have this, this object, this double, and the dimensions. I know this will be a two-dimensional array. And then this is, that's a type, yeah, and there's a buffer. And this is not allowed to be none. If it's none, there will be an exception. That's why this not none means. And I do this for both of them. And I have a third one, which is an output. So I have two inputs and an output. An output is just also something I put. I put in, and then I have to, do, have to do a few checks. So I have to do the CDEF, so that's, I tell, okay, that's an unsigned integer for X and Y, for inner and outer, I would like to use. And then I have to make sure the shapes of both arrays agree, because if I don't check this, there might be some strange results. And if, if, if they don't agree, I have to write a type error. So I have to, be, have to do a few things here to make it work. And if there's no output, yeah, because output defaults to none, then I create an empty array which is, has the same shape as the buffer. So I create an output to put things in. And then I just get a shortcut to this is uh, buffer one, the inner and the outer, just to going through my loop variables. This will be the next slide. So I have this one and now go through. And I just write x-ray for x and x-range, something you usually don't write in Python if you want things fast. But this, you go here, it goes to size and you can do this and go through. And now I'm doing this, uh, this calculation. This is my calculation. A plus b times 2 plus 
A times B. Yeah? This is A and this is B here, called buffer one and buffer two in this case because they're buffer. And this is my calculation I'm doing. And this is something usually you want you want this and avoid a NumPy for all costs doing something like this, but in size it's different because eventually this stuff will be translated to C, and you get a C loop out of it. Okay, this is a this is this function that, that works on this tile, and this is not doing anything by itself, but will be called by an, yet another function, and this one now looks like this. Now this one gets my original A and B in here and returns something. You see, I have my array, 2D views, but I called it here, and this one gets these two double arrays, A and B, in our case, and this will be the result we spit out. And we still have to do the, the definition here, get those things, and now I go through the, uh, do the whole thing. It's just two dimensional here, and have this buffer, and I go through and do the same calculation here, and go to this inner and outer. And then, uh, I do this as a whole, I go through the whole stuff here, and now I have this. Uh, Do I have the same thing twice? Yeah. Now, now it goes goes through, and I calculate on this those four f four things. You see, I, have, I get my whole array in here, and do this, do this with this, with this uh, uh, um, four four times. So yeah, I have to do all these checks again that I make sure that the, that the, that the shapes are all right. Otherwise, I get a get a problem here, and then I create my output again, and then you see I'm doing my vertical and uh, splitting, and I have four sub-arrays. Now I have four sub-arrays, and this four, I call this uh, view function here, and this four sub-arrays, and split this four sub-arrays. I programmed this all out. You can write, make it nice and write a loop, probably, but I programmed this all out to see how this works. So now I have four calculations and those four sub-arrays, and this is just calling the other function I just defined before. Yeah. So that's why there's, there's many functions. So this one is just uh, using the other function as just defined before and calling it. And I put in this uh, quad one and quad two, quad three, quad four, which are these sub arrays I create with the slices here. So these are the slices. So instead of repeating the slices all the time, this would be a lot of, would be very noisy. I just define them once here and reuse them here. So a slice object is nothing special. It's a, that's built in in Python. So that's pretty much the thing. And that means now I have four calculations and this is four different things. So it's a bit work doing it here uh, manually. Probably you could automate a few things, but as a, to show you how this works now, you can run it on, this, on the thing. And actually this, is, this gives you a very nice speed up if you just run it without anything in parallel here uh, because you, you have this effect of what's called tiling. So instead of going through all the rows, uh, of your array, you just go through a sub-array and this is shorter, and then you can take advantage of this, this cache effects, and this, this speeds up things quite a while, and I haven't done anything in parallel yet. Just doing it instead of going through the whole thing, going to parts of those things. This would be one thing to speed up things. So you see it's pretty low level actually here, so you think more in C terms than in, than in Python terms, uh, but you have the full, you can get a lot of Leverage, if you wanted to optimize things and try things out, you can try different sizes of this array, sizes, sub arrays, and those kind of things, and can work with it. Okay, now this is not parallel yet, but this is a, you need to set it up like this to actually, in the end, use OpenMP to do this. So, OpenMP is the de facto standard to do parallel things, and pretty much all of the modern compilers su support OpenMP. And though you, you it's very nice you can use this because Sison supports OpenMP and OpenMP itself is a, it's a big tool and has a lot of options. And for this one, because you can, have, you can run this, this parallelization under different kind of, um, with different options to how they work. So in this case, I can use a static. So every, every process gets the same amount of resources. You can also give OpenMP the flex, say, do it yourself and figure out which one takes, needs more computational time. But since I chop my array in four uh, sizes, for equal sizes, I can just use a static one. So you, there's a lot of things you can do with it, just as an example here. Now I have to import parallel. So I have this, this setup that we have before, where I can work on those four sub-arrays, and now this is was a prerequisite to make it parallel. So this domain decomposition is something probably most of the time you have to do some way or the other. 
to, to get it to, to work in parallel. And you see now I have to have this this util extra args I have to supply when I compile it. I have to say minus open minus f open mp here for the for the extra compiler extra link arguments to actually enable open mp. And then I have to import parallel to make things work in parallel. And then now you see how, how this works. Here I define a CDEF function with the same, very, looks very similar to what I did before, but to say no gil. You see? That's something that you can do only with functions that are pure C. So as soon as you use the no gil option, everything has to be C. As soon as you work with a Python object, you cannot do this. That's a problem. Uh, uh, therefore, you have to make sure everything is C. If, if, you, if you still have some Python objects in the other compiler, will comp complain it doesn't work. So you have to be totally in C land if you use some Python, no gil uh, doesn't work. The rest is a, is a similar thing which I just did here, only that I add this no gil. The rest is what we had before uh, going, going through here. And then the next one, I have this uh, view again with the output. And I, I do this, I, I do this um, checking again of, of, the, of the types. And if there's no output, I set it to the uh, ID and here I, I define a thread ID. I work the, the first naive implementation I do here is with threads, so you can work with threads if you like to explicitly. So you can ex address each thread separately if you like to. For our problem, it's not problem is not ne really necessary. That's actually a better solution. But to show you what you can do is you can explicitly work with threads and go to this, this level of threads. And that's why I need to assign this thread ID. And then you see how it looks like here. I turn on my no gil, you see I make a list with IDs, this is important here. And then I turn a no gil and say parallel, parallel, and number of threads is four. So I use four threads here. Uh, so you can actually specify the number of threads there. And then I create, get my thread ID. And now I want to work with my list, and since lists don't, are Python objects, I cannot use gil, so I have to say with gil, so I have another context manager here, and turn on the gil, but only for this small, for this one line, and then it turns off the gil. So the gil is off, on. Then every time it's off again, and every time I go through the loop, because it's several times here, uh, as, as I'm here, it will be, will be on, I get the thread ID. So every thread will call this code, and then you will, can identify the thread ID. And then I explicitly programmed if else loops, for the thread ID. Probably you could do this more elegantly, but this shows you very nicely what I'm doing here. And actually now, instead of using the slices, I use this V and colon here, which is exactly the same as our second, our quadrant slicing here, but only in a different spelling. Maybe you see the different thing, how it works. So this is a, the first quadrant, the second quadrant, and so on. And every quadrant will be calculated in a different thread. And since I'm running all under OpenMP, every thread will already run on a different CPU or uh, whenever, whatever, whatever the operating office offers as a CPU. And I have four different threads. And unlike Python threads, which are just in one CPU thread, so to speak, and just or, or run only one CPU, and Python takes care that only can one, run, uh, one can run at any at, at time, here they can be really run in parallel. And that's the difference. But for this, you have to really use no gil, otherwise this doesn't work. And as soon as you touch a Python object like here, you have to turn on the gil again. So that's something uh, a bit low level, probably, compared with what else you do with Python, but you would have access to this parallelism here. And then I just print out the ID, so you see that I have these four threads running, and yeah, the distributors over these four threads. Okay, this is pretty tedious, so if I have eight threads, you would write seven LS statements. That's probably not really elegant. So if you do the same thing anyway, you can use parallel range. So if you, if you know I have these four subarrays, and, but they are all the same, actually I do the same thing, uh, I could use a parallel range, so the, the introduction is the same, I don't need a thread ID, and then I do something like this. You see now it's much shorter code, code. I just say no gil, and have this, uh, this, 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 this size and bound check is a decorator and a context manager at the same time, so I can use it as a decorator and a context manager. So I use this as a context manager here. And I have those two context turns on. And then I can go with this parallel P range, so the parallel range, and I throw in my function I want to call. And here I can even give it a, this, this is an open MP instruction. So static means every 
thread gets the same amount of, of, uh, of CPU time, so to speak, and there are three more other options that can make things more dynamic and you can give more uh, work to, the, to OpenMP to make things dynamic, which would be better if, you have, if, if it's not equal, but it comes with some overhead, likely because there are some context switching bit, between them. And then the number of threads here. And then just go through here, and I see now going and doing, doing this thing on this buffers here, and can throw in this just like this, so it's much nicer to work with. I don't have to bother with threads, and you can use P range. So it's not that unelegant as the other one. The other one with threads would be very useful if you really have threads that might have different things to do. Then you, you could use threads, but si since you have the same thing to do, you can use P range, you distribute it, and now it works in parallel. It's still a bit noise around here compared to a Python loop, but it's much, much less. It's just this context manager here, and then this, this static thing that you have here. Compared this, if you compare it with a multi-processing code, uh, it's pretty similar, yeah? So but that's what you get out of it. And then uh, let's look at the results. So the speed up. So if you, if you use different numbers of threads, it is just run on the machine with these two physical cores and hyper-threading. So it looks like I get a speed up of exactly two if I use four threads, which kind of corresponds with my physical cores, and the hyper-threading doesn't have any effect, more or less, uh, on the thing. So the, the hyper-threading doesn't really work. If I had four physical cores, that might be different. But you see, you get a speed up using uh, different numbers of threads, which kind of proves that this OpenMP uh, works, and you get something, can get something out of it. This comes as a grain of salt because the, the, the other implementation I showed before was just the tiling without going parallel. Remember when I just go on this four quadrants and work on them separately, gave me speed up of four without doing anything, without doing anything special. I got a, got a speed up of four because I get this, this tiling effect, which in this case it's better than the parallel effect. So parallel is not everything. There might be a lot of other things you can explore before you go to the to parallel route. Uh, to get things, but if it had, would have more cores, it would be much, much likely that it, that it scales pretty nicely. As long as the array is big enough and things are uh, work with this, then you get some speed up. Okay, uh, this is the conclusion. You see, it's, the code is quite a bit involved and you might not understand all the details here. And there are, as we saw in the other talk, there are other tools that might be better for other approaches. Size and OpenMP allow to work, and you can turn off the, the GIL, which, which works, and you can run threads in parallel and do something you cannot do in pure Python. That's the first thing. But there are surprises to it, because you need to write more code, and you need to write and understand not only Python, but only C and OpenMP uh, to a certain degree. Uh, this is a simple example. If things get more complex, there will be strange error messages maybe, and they might be caused by some code in the C, on the C level or the OpenMP and other things, and they make things more complex, of course. And it is part of the, the Python safety net you have. So you do have to check for ch shapes of arrays, and you have to check for a lot of things which come for free with Python. Because here everything is optimized for C, and as you see, I even turn off the bound check and stuff, so probably when you debug, you want to turn on bound check first to make sure everything works. And exactly, exactly you, you, need, you need to know some C. If you, if you, need to, if you want to work with science, uh, you need to know a few things of C because that's actually where the big advantage comes from. You know C, then you can dive deep in C. So if you know C anyway already, then Sison is likely a good tool because you can apply all the knowledge. If C is very new to you, that might be quite a bit of a learning curve because a few things are different there. Okay. This is my conclusions. Maybe it gives you one example that is kind of useful, and you can really try and play with it, those things, and usually that's, that's, that's something, of course there can be more complex things, and then there might be some problems that I, I don't mention here, but hope you get some impression what you can do with Cython. Thank you very much. I think we have time for questions, yeah. Yeah, the slides will be online. So I put the slides online here, and I also I put, I put the source code also. You can try it. Those things should run, so I compiled other things. So you can try and play with it. That's where, where the effect comes from. Yeah. Have you done any benchmarking of using OpenCL instead of OpenMP? No, no, I haven't done any other benchmarking. So this is something you could do other benchmarking. And uh, OpenCL, if you have, might, might, for this type of problem, might work. But you have to really have to measure. 
but it's likely that those things will have an effect. Because it's embarrassing parallel, so to speak, because everything, every operation is independent. So you should, you should could scale it up to more processors, more CPUs. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, see, see important is if, if you want to import a, 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 a extension files in Python. So you have, you have to, this, the problem is if you work with Sysyn, you have pure Python code, you have pure C code, and you have Sysyn code which can do both. And not everything fits together. Everything with a C, it's, it's C, and everything with a normal font name is Python. And from, from, if you cannot call directly to those C files, you have to have intermediate layer with Python in between. Most of the time, there are some new things now, but that's typically how it works. You have to have some, that's why I had this wrapper around. You have the C def, you cannot really call this one. Right. And the, the other imports, uh, you can also write extensions where you can import existing C libraries and, and, and compile them with, with your code. So writing extensions, I haven't covered writing extensions here. So you can write C extensions, C++ extensions, which is a bit of a different topic, but it's pretty easy compared to doing it by hand. Doing it by hand, you write so much, and you get it two lines. The, the, this, this is just a code, you, you, now you have to distinguish because you have a compile step between the, what the developer's doing and what the user's doing. So as I said, you can use it, you, you use this setup py, generate an extension, and you give the user an extension, he never, he never even sees a compiler or any C code. He just sees an extension which is just uh, a shared library. Yeah. Any more questions? No? Then I want to go quickly back to where I started from. So of course I have some new people. So if you, uh, just to repeat, so that will be EuroPython in, uh, in July this year in, in, in Berlin, which is just maybe an hour from here per airplane, a bit more maybe. And it would be, it's very interesting because you get a full week of the European Python community speaking, training, so trainings are in parallel there. We have posters. and. Then the PyData Berlin will be there, right, included into uh, your Python, so the 24th to the 27th, you will have PyData Berlin there also. So if you like the PyData event, you're invited to come there and then just extend a little bit and come to your Python also. That's something I would like advertise here. And this is the Python event in Europe and you should not miss it, we have close to 300 uh, submissions for talks and trainings and posters, though there will be a lot and something for everybody, I guess. Thank you very much. <laughs>